I mean, what the heck is copyright? To the right, to the right. Um, hope you got some stuff out of that. And it's going to set up what we are going to talk about throughout today. And um, so I hope you do get a good sense of what copyright is, how long it lasts, what it protects, what the public domain is, and what is fair use. Okay, well, fair use is a defensible position. So if you're sued for infringing on someone's copyright, okay, your defense possibility is fair use. Now, fair use is going to be at the crux of remixing and remix cultures that we're going to talk about this term. Fair use is a concept that allows you to use copyrighted works to make fun of them or to critique them for commentary purposes. It allows you to do let's play videos. It allows you to do film commentaries where you use clips from the films. It allows you to do parodies. Okay. Now, the reason why this film is a fair use, and we'll go through this in, in much more detail as the term goes on, is because it's for educational purposes. It teaches you about copyright. It also uses a company and texts made by a company, the Walt Disney Company, who is a very litigious company. They sue everybody for everything and a lot of copyright infringement. Furthermore, um, <clears throat> the Disney Company is also very, beyond being very protective of its works, most of its key works, all, almost all of its key works, Frozen included, have come from them borrowing from the public domain. Now, Disney also lobbied in the late 90s to extend copyright duration by an additional 20 years as Mickey Mouse was five years away from being public domain. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So, the irony in all this is that it's a critique of Disney and it's an educational um, piece that tells you about copyright using Disney as sort of the, the muse, so, so to speak. Now, would Disney allow the filmmaker to use these clips to make commentary on it, to license or use these legally? Oh, hell no, right? So um, it's an important concept. It allow, fair use allows for news purposes. It allows for shows like Tosh.0 or The Daily Show to exist. Um, you know, all sorts of, you know, economically viable uses of other people's works without permission for commentary critique, um, you know, building purposes, educational purposes, newsworthy purposes, all that stuff. So we'll talk about that more throughout the term. One way you can know that something is a fair use, um, and it kind of, you know, you're thinking about, oh yeah, you know, they're using other people's works and it's on YouTube. And it's still on YouTube. That's a good sense that it's a fair use. When you get a YouTube takedown notice, you have a few options. You can say, um, no, I own it, uh, which typically isn't the case. Or, you know, no, I'm not taking this down because it's a, fair, it's a fair use. And YouTube has to honor that or at least consider that. And the owner of the content has to at least consider that your you know, unauthorized use of its work may be a fair one. So we'll spend a lot of time, a whole day talking about this and we'll talk about fair use throughout the whole term. I'll use my little Panam uh, chart, uh, which will probably be boring and annoying as shit by the end of the term, but you gotta know how to do it um, and we'll get, we'll get us there. So I'd ask you to read a little bit from um, a book chapter from Vedhaya Nathan. Now, uh, listen again, you know, try to do your best to read this stuff. Um, I hope that you can. And I'll pull some hot nuggets out of, out of this for y'all. Okay, but basically what he says is, and we kind of saw this when we were talking about Lessig um, at the end of the last unit, um, where basically at the beginning of the 20th century, the early 1900s, these laws, laws governing copyrights or copyrightable works, right, started to favor producers, professional producers, a.k.a corporations at the favor, um, you know, and at the expense of us, us peasants, us consumers, okay, as we move to a more professional uh, model of making culture, um, the laws start to reflect the producers of it, which aren't people, right? It stops being people, regular, natural people. We're natural people. And laws start to favor the cultural production of juristic people, which are corporations. We'll learn next class about how corporations became people and how corporations uh, became authors. Okay, We're seeing this right now um, in so many ways, but America's greatest export is intellectual property in the form of patentable um, pharmaceuticals, in the form of 
copyrightable texts like movies and, and music and video games in the form of trademarkable uh, goods like Nike sneakers and Adidas hoodies and, and stuff like that. Okay, but it's, 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 our, it's, it's, a, it's our greatest export. We don't export physical goods, we export ideas uh, to the world. Um, and it actually makes up, you know, these exports and these you know, intellectual properties actually make up a roughly 40% of the American GDP, which is our economy, is, is primarily made up of, of the creation and sale and commodification of, of ideas, okay? Um, and Vidhi Nathan basically goes on to talk about, you know, these laws have like, they don't encourage creativity. They've moved past this, this essence. Remember this economic incentive where you get a limited monopoly in order for you to keep creating. It's moved away from this. The laws have moved away from this idea of encouraging creativity and scientific, you know, thought and, and democratic access to stuff. And it protects producers companies primarily at the expense and taxes us consumers. You don't realize everything that you buy, you know, the majority of what you're paying for is not the physical good. Um, you're paying for the branded logo on the University of Oregon hoodie that you get. Like the hoodie itself is inexpensive to make and manufacture. So you're paying for basically the O and the Nike swoosh. Um, that, that's on it. You know, when you buy a Blu-ray, the Blu-ray disc costs very little to make and to distribute. You're paying for the, the intellectual property that's encoded into the, into the grooves, okay? He suggests that too, that like, in order to have a healthy public sphere, as, as, that meaning like, you know, an informed rich citizenship, you need to have access to information and ideas and that copyright is one major gatekeeper to having access, okay? Now, when you think about, you know, hey, we're in the age of the internet, like, information is pretty freely distributed. <clears throat> but you have to think, like, back 20 years ago. So, like, when Disney and the Church of Scientology and Dr. Seuss's estate were lobbying to extend copyright by 20 years, uh, we didn't know about it. Why? Because ABC is owned by Disney, you know. Uh, all these major news organizations, newspapers, are owned by larger conglomerates that own, you know, game publishers and movie studios and, uh, you know, record labels. So, of course, why would the news organizations that they own report on it? Well, you know, here we are 20, 22 years later, right? We get our information primarily from, from the Internet, and so you can get this, this information. So, um, you know... Things have kind of changed since he, he wrote this book in terms of how we get information and what's available. But he also says this, and I just want to stress this. Companies use intellectual property laws, laws to make fire, to make ideas artificially scarce. This is just so, 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 so important. How do you make what is infinitely repeatable, infinitely reproducible, like an idea or like a text in the form of an MP3, a song in the form of an mp3, a movie in the, in the form of an, a .mov, something that's infinitely reproducible, that doesn't reprodu uh, replace the original in the market or, 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 or take it out of the market, so to speak. You know, uh, how do you create scarcity, right? And you use laws to create scarcity and to make value out of something that is infinitely repeatable and wants to just spread. And I got this tree on the roof of my barn making hella scratchy noises. I got to get my chainsaw going. <laughs> um, by the way, my poison oak is still fucking bothering me. But uh, we're doing all right over here. All right. So the basics of copyright. You want to know. You are interested. You are like into this shit right now. Right? You're interested. Listen, I'm not going to test you on this type of stuff. But if you're super hyped, right, you could uh, get on a plane and fly back to Eugene and go to Knight Law Library and you could look up copyright law in Title 17 of United States Code. Now, if you want to find any federal laws, they're all in different titles of USC or United States Code. So you can find all the criminal stuff, you can find business law, and they're all in their own titles. For copyright, if you're hyped up, go to Title 17 and you can find it in there. Copyright protects this. This is really important. Just, just know this for the test. The expression of an idea, it protects the expression of an idea fixed in a tangible medium. Typed onto a word, type, a word, a, a word document, 
written on a piece of paper, snapped with a camera, etc. Okay, we know it comes from the Constitution, right? So this and patent law both come from the Constitution. Now, how long does it last? Well, for us, natural people, the entirety of our lives plus 70 years. So it encourages us to keep creating from the grave 70 years after our death. But if we make something that's economically viable, our great, great, great grandchildren will be able to make dough off of it, which is pretty rad for them. Okay, for juristic people, these are corporations. The duration of their copyright is 95 years. They actually get more, up to 120 years, but it's 95 years from publication. And again, most companies, they make a film, they make a video game, and they publish it instantly, right? So, um, so, they, so, so, so th that doesn't really matter, but if like an album was shelved um, you know, 20, 20 years ago, right? Like, and its copyright of 95 years would start today if the record label decided to put it out, or if it's even older, if it's 30 years old, you know, um, they would only get 90 years from starting now because it was, it was made uh, 125 years ago or whatever, but they get 120 years of copyright, 95 years from publication, okay? So public domain, what the hell's the public domain? Okay, it's, it's very small, um, but it's basically anything, wink, hint, nudge. Wink, hint, nudge means it'll probably be on the test, right? It's anything that is copyrightable, and we'll talk about what is copyrightable, and you should have seen it in the Disney film, uh, other than sound recordings made before 1925. So anything made before 1925, any movie, any song composition, any painting, any drawing, any sculpture, uh, any dance choreography, anything, you know, made before 1925 is in the public domain. It's ours. We can do whatever we want with it, okay? Um, so basically, if it was made in 1924, it's public domain and before, okay? But there's some variants to that, and we'll talk about that later in the term. Our current federal governing act, just so you know, is the Copyright Act of 1976. Wow, that's really applicable to 2020. Think about the technologies then, right? Maybe VHS, Betamax tape, reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape, cassette tapes were just kind of out. I mean, eight tracks. I mean, you know, it's just such a different world. And our, our current laws are governed by this. So um, people have been interpreting what this means for the digital era. That's why things are all messed up and nobody really knows. Last thing, you don't need a copyright symbol on your work for it to have copyright, meaning the C with a circle around it. You don't need that at all. And you don't need to register with the copyright office. In the United States, the moment you take a picture, the moment you record some video, the moment you draw something that is both just a little bit creative, just a little bit original, um, and it's fixed in a medium, you have copyright on it for life plus 70 years, okay? Now, you can register with the copyright office, okay? This is called the formality. What you do is you pay now. It used to be a $35 fee. I think it's gone up to $45. You pay a $45 fee. You, you, you send two copies of your work to the Library of Congress, and you have a copyright, you know, a, 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 a you know, basically, um, you know, you've registered your copyright. Now, what this means is this. Um, you can sue for statutory damages. This is, this is cr like crazy, which is up to $150,000 per infringement. If you have like the normal copyright, i.e. I took a picture, someone uses it, and they made $100, I can only sue them for actual damages, which is $100, okay, that they made off of my work. Now, if I filed and registered my copyright, I can sue them for up to $150,000 per infringement. So say that that $100 they made was off of selling 10 of my photographs or whatever, right? Uh, well, that now, those 10 infringements go up to a million and a half dollars that I can ask. Now, no one, they're not going to pay that. We'll settle out of court or whatever. But that's the advantage of registering your copyright. Most companies register their copyright on everything. Most Natural people, we don't, because, well, I mean, probably we didn't even know until today what the fuck copyright was, so. Okay, 
What are your exclusive rights? Now, if you're real hyped, you can go to uh, Title 17 of the United States Code, subsection 106. Okay, and these are your five rights. The way that you can remember this stuff is the RP3Ds, okay? And again, you can go to the slide that says the RP3Ds. This is the exclusive rights. So the uh, moment you get copyright, right? The moment you fix in a semi or, you know, a barely original, barely creative idea, in a, in a tangible medium, you have these five exclusive rights. Number one, reproduction. You have the right to make copies, digital, physical, whatever. You have the right of performance, okay? The right of performance is kind of weird. If you wrote a play, right, you have the right to perform that play. So if a high school wants to do, um, you know, a, a performance of your play, they have to pay you. If you wrote a book, um, Someone can't read that book at a bookstore, right? Only you, the author, or whoever's the author by law, can read that, read that book, can, perf can perform it. Um, you, for sound recordings, this doesn't exist um, in the physical world. It exists for online. So um, the way you can think of, you know, um, when a song is played on radio, there's performance rights for uh, uh, the songwriters. So whoever wrote the song that you hear, they're getting paid performance rights. The record label and recording artists who own the sound recording, they're not getting paid for radio that you listen to in your car. However, for um, you know, Pandora or Spotify or whatever, there are performance rights for record labels and recording artists, and there are performance rights, obviously, for composers. But when a song is played at Autzen Stadium, when it's played at a supermarket, it's considered the performance of a composition or lyrics that are in the sound recording itself. It's kind of weird. Now, our first D is prepare derivatives. This is vital to this class. A derivative is basically using a copyrighted work in another copyrighted work. So, using someone's song in your movie, using uh, someone's uh, you know, a little bit of someone's song in your beat that you make and you know, if you do into sampling and stuff. Um, if you translate a book into another language, if you use someone's art on a film set, if you use someone's art as the basis, basis for a film set design, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, you know, use a song in a video game, these are all considered derivatives. These, you know, this is where remixing happens, right? Using someone else's media in a new and different way. It's called preparing derivatives. Now, we'll talk about the difference of what a derivative use is versus a transformative use. Transformative use will often be under fair use. A derivative use is you're basically exploiting the original, whatever aesthetic quality of it, you're not commenting on it or building upon it, you're exploiting, ex ex exploiting it. The next D is distribute, so distribute copies. This could be distribute copies for online sale, for brick and mortar sale, um, etc. And you have the right to display the work publicly. So if you're a photographer, you have the right, you know, someone can't just do a, a show of all your photos or someone can't just take a, a bunch of photos, dope photos from Instagram and, and do a, a, you know, an exhibit or whatever. Someone can't display your copyrighted statue or, or sculpture. Um, you know, people can't show your films, um, etc. Um, and so that's, that's that. And there are, as I said, performance rights for sound recordings, for satellite and digital radio, and for streaming platforms. Okay, so RP3Ds and derivatives, prepare derivatives, super, super clutch to know what that is. Okay, so how do you get copyright ownership? Um, this is pretty simple, right? First off, we already know this, it has to be fixed in a medium. Take the picture, bam, you have it. It doesn't even have to be lit, hashtag lit. Right? It can only be just unlit. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be framed perfectly. You could just take a picture. Now, it's not that creative, but it's an original kind of creative work. You know, write a, a term paper, uh, anything. You fix something in a medium, you own the copyright on it. Okay? Someone needs to be able to see it, hear it, um, etc. Next is originality. The idea needs to be like, its origin needs to be an ind independent creation of an author. I don't know what this means. Um, <laughs> I don't know what originality means in 2020. 
you know, like I said, like for me, like what's original is how you flip the past and make it relevant to the present, you know. Um, I kind of embrace that, like, you're influenced directly, indirectly in anything you make. But it just has to be, you know, recognize that you're the original author. It has to be minimally creative, right? I don't know what that means either. Minimal creative, I mean, think about it. When you write a term paper, like, how creative do you feel? You know, when you take a photo and you apply a filter to it, like, that's a level of creativity, but how creative do you feel, right? Versus, like, when you write a song. Uh, versus like when you produce a short film, you know, versus like when you write a poem or you, you, cre you, you know, you, you create a fashion line or anything like, like that. And it's really weird, like when this goes to court, if this ever goes to court, who decides what is original and what is creative? Judges. Judges. Let's just think when we're talking about art and creativity, Law school does not necessarily produce that. Years of being in the court and interpreting law does not necessarily produce that. So it create, creates a sort of quandary in terms of when these things ever go to court, like what is actually creative. All right, so here's the deal. You're bored. I know you need to have like maybe a jewel, maybe a little coffee, maybe a shot of whiskey, maybe take a nap, go for a walk, play with your dog, um, you know, play a little Fortnite. Uh, bump a little trap music, whatever you got to do. Just, you know, whatever. Go take a walk, chill out. We'll come back. We'll talk a little bit more about this stuff. I know you are enthralled. I know you are like into this shit. You're like going to have talks about it at dinner with the family, with your friends, whatever. I know you're like, I can feel your excitement through the screen, but um, I'm spitting. <laughs> Anyways, uh, be back in a few minutes. Just take a little break and we'll, 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 we'll continue on with this joy.